Welcome to the Inventors Lab. My name is Reva Winter, and I am one of the inventors in residence here at Frost Science, as well as being the curator of marine science. Here in the Inventors Lab, we are working on a collaborative project with the University of Miami to explore different ways that we can improve the heat resistance and stress tolerance of corals that are being grown in coral nurseries for coral reef restoration. One of the things we've been exploring here in the Inventors Lab is this idea of hormetic stress. Hormesis is the phenomenon by which you can get a beneficial response in an organism by exposing it to a low or controlled dose of a stressor that would be damaging at higher levels. So as I mentioned, we're really interested in high temperature stress tolerance, and that's because, of course, coral reefs are being subjected to increasingly frequent and severe episodes of what's known as coral bleaching, which uh, is sort of a generalized stress response, but we're seeing it as a global mass phenomenon as a result of climate change and our warming ocean temperatures. So you might wonder then why we're interested in high light stress. So as I mentioned, hormesis uh, allows you to get a beneficial response in an organism through exposure to some type of stressor. So we're curious to see whether our corals, after exposure to high light stress, will then acquire elevated temperature tolerance. So this is just one of the things we're exploring here in the lab. We're also really curious about this symbiotic relationship that corals have with their communities of uh, beneficial algae that live inside their tissue. A lot of people know these algae as zooxanthellae. They're in the family Symbiodiniaceae. It's a family of dinoflagellate algae, and they live in corals by the millions. And this is why we tend to find coral reefs in these shallow, sunlit, tropical waters, because the coral is relying very heavily on these photosynthetic beneficial partners. Coral bleaching, of course, is then the, the breakdown of this relationship. So high temperature can cause stress, but high light can cause stress for the algae as well. Temperature and light are kind of like two sides of the same coin. It's a very similar currency in terms of their, their cellular physiology. So we're curious to see whether this high light stress can then translate to elevated temperature tolerance once those corals have recovered from high light and are then challenged subsequently with high temperature. We're really interested in high light in particular because we want to be able to do this type of work, this type of hormetic challenging with our corals at the coral nurseries where they're being grown. We don't want to have to rely on bringing corals back to the lab and back to land every time we want to improve their, their tolerance to future stress. And we've lost, unfortunately, we've lost so many corals now that there's a lot of emphasis being placed on coral restoration. So now there are tens of thousands of coral fragments being grown in coral nurseries for outplantation to our local reef systems. Basically every county here in South Florida has its own nursery and outplanting operation. We're working very closely with the University of Miami's experimental nursery program and that's where all of the corals behind me here have come from. So these are all nursery grown corals that we're working with and again we're trying to develop a version of this technique that doesn't rely on the lab. We want to be as efficient and effective as possible so the ability to do this type of work at the coral nursery out in the field is paramount. We can't control the temperature of the ocean, obviously. So we can't rely on using a, sort of an early controlled high temperature challenge to improve subsequent tolerance to high temperature. So we're seeing whether we can use high light stress to improve heat tolerance later on.
And we can do this in the field just by changing the depth of these corals. So they're growing in the nurseries at 20, 25 feet. And if we raise them up to very shallow depths to be stressed for free by the light from the sun, then the idea is that we can improve the corals heat tolerance before they get outplanted with just this sort of minor step in between. So to look at our our stress levels in real time or near real time in our corals, we use a device called an imaging pulse amplitude modulated fluorometer. This gives us a metric uh, called FV over FM, which is basically photochemical efficiency. Uh, and for this experiment, we're going to be putting the IPAM through its paces a little bit. So in not just getting photochemical efficiency, but being able to do kinetics and light curves so that we can get estimates of non-photochemical quenching and, um, and electron transport rate. So we're really interested in, in more fully characterizing the photophysiology of these algae under stress and specifically under these two types of stressful conditions. The, the algae, of course, are living inside the coral by the millions. So we're not just interested in, in their function, we're also interested in who is there in the coral community, right, in, inside the tissue. Uh, and so to do that, we have to take small tissue samples and run genetic analysis. The different types of algae that live inside the coral tissue all look the same. So interestingly, when they were first discovered, that led to their being given a single species name because Looking at them under a microscope, they all are basically the same color, the same size, roughly uh, the same shape. Uh, so you can't distinguish them morphologically. And for a long time, they, they were thought to be not very diverse. But once we were able to start analyzing this partnership using more advanced genetic tools, we were able to realize that there's a tremendous amount of cryptic diversity in this family of, of algae. And the different types have really interesting and sometimes very different physiological tolerances. So this leads me to one of the other things that we're really interested in looking at here. Is how much can we influence or manipulate the symbiotic relationship of these corals being grown in nurseries to encourage them to associate with a type of algae that is more heat resistant. So there's one kind of these algae, Durosdinium trenchi, that already lives here in Florida and throughout the Caribbean. So we're not introducing anything that isn't already in our ecosystem. We're just creating the conditions, or we're working to create the conditions for these corals to be able to trade out the type of algae that they have to include in the community uh, this heat resistant partner. So it's been shown that this partner boosts corals thermal tolerance by about a degree and a half to two degrees centigrade. That maybe doesn't sound like too much, but when you remember that temperatures as little as one degree too hot for too long can cause coral bleaching, a boost of a degree and a half to two degrees is a pretty big physiological buffer for these animals. And remember, they're stuck to the bottom, so they can't swim away and find conditions that are more suitable. They have to just sort of hunker down and be able to handle what the environment is throwing at them. And that's why we've seen such decline, because these animals rely on a partner that can't take the heat. So as these heat stress events are happening more frequently and more severely, for example in 14 and 15 we had back-to-back -back bleaching events here in Florida for the first time ever. So these corals are needing to withstand this type of stress and we need to start planning for that for our conservation to be effective long term. If we just keep planting corals out that are going to succumb the next time that we see a really hot summer, then all of that conservation effort will have been wasted. So to ensure that the limited resources going into coral reef conservation are as efficiently and effectively used as possible, we need to make sure that when these small pieces of coral get planted out onto the reef, that they have the best chance possible of surviving long term so that they can grow to contribute to fish habitat and to start spawning and contributing to the next generation so that these populations can continue to evolve to this environmental change on their own. One of the main questions being asked is how can we use coral reef restoration to improve the coastal protection capacity of our local reefs? And this is happening right off of Miami Beach. So we'll be planting out uh, these heat resistant corals onto hybrid structures basically. These, it's sort of a, 
a hybrid between gray infrastructure and green infrastructure. Right, so gray is built, man-made. Green infrastructure are natural systems like coral reefs that are serving some sort of infrastructural purpose. So for coral reefs, this would be their ability to act as living breakwaters to absorb wave energy and protect the coastline. And in a place like Miami, where we're, we've got buildings right up to the waterline, this is a really valuable service that these reefs are providing. So the question is, can we use coral, uh, coral outplanting and habitat restoration to serve the dual purpose of rebuilding fish habitat on the one hand and improving this wave buffering capacity on the other? So the College of Engineering is getting involved as well at the University of Miami, uh, designing both from a materials science point of view, sort of what materials do corals grow best on, for example, but also just from a, a structural engineering point of view, what, what type of structure is best at buffering that wave capacity. To plant these sort of hybrid structures out near our local reef systems to improve the wave attenuation that they perform and to provide a substrate for coral restoration and, and habitat uh, conservation. One of the next things that we're really interested in looking at here in the Inventors Lab is exploring how coral genotypes that are coming from different thermal regimes might have different um, sort of locally adapted thermal tolerances. And we're curious to see how even very small differences in the average temperatures that these different coral genotypes might be seeing across the year might then translate to local adaptation and, and elevated thermal tolerance. And so we'll be testing different coral genotypes that have been collected from different thermal regimes to see how stress tolerant they are as a way to inform which genotypes might be best suited for reef restoration efforts in different places. So once again, my name is Dr. Reva Winter, inventor in residence here at Frost Science, and thanks for watching. So this brings me to another piece of what we're looking at here in the Inventors Lab. We're really interested to see how, uh, <laughs> sorry, I just got this is really distracted by people coming and looking at, it's like a fishbowl, a little bit, <laughs> fishbowl situation. Okay. So one of the things we've been exploring here in the Inventors Lab is this idea of, hold on really quickly, do you want me to be looking at you or like down camera? Uh, camera. Okay. <laughs>